George Shapiro here at the AMMG in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada uh, with our ongoing series. Uh, today we're going to speak to Dr. Ward Dean who uh, is discussing the neuroendocrine history of, of aging. Uh, Dr. Dean, why don't you tell us about your background and how you got involved with uh, age, you know, age management medicine and uh, talk about your theory. Well, actually, I've been at this for over 60 years. I started when I was about 12 years old when a librarian introduced me to uh, two books, uh, uh, Look Younger, Live Longer, and Eat and Grow Younger, both by a couple of uh, famous nutritionists in the early 50s. And as I was trying to decide whether I wanted to check these books out or not, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and uh, said, uh, you're a little young to be worrying about that, aren't you, Sonny? And I looked up at him and I thought, well, it might be a little, I may be too young, but he's a little too old. And from that point on, I started studying the aging process. And uh, later on, I, I uh, graduated from West Point. I was in the infantry for six years. And all during this time, I kept uh, applying to medical schools. And I was rejected by about 20 or 30 medical schools in the United States. And after Vietnam, I went to Korea. And while I was in Korea, I went around knocking on medical school doors there. And I found two schools that said they would take me if I learned Korean. So I got out of the Army, went to uh, Korean University, studied Korean, and was accepted at Hanyang University, where I graduated in 1978. Oh, that's and cool. that was what, that, from then on, I was destined to be an anti-aging doctor. Oh, that's great. So, so uh, can you tell me about the theory? Yeah, in 1981, I read a book by a Russian, uh, The Law of Deviation of Homeostasis and Diseases of Aging. And that's a very complex title, and I didn't even understand it. Uh, but I read the book, and it was uh, pretty rough because it was a translation into uh, English from Russian. And there were a lot of things I didn't understand, so I started writing to Professor Dillman, and he laboriously answered all my questions. And 11 years later, he came to the United States, and we collaborated on a book. But his theory basically is that the aging process is due to a loss of sensitivity of the hypothalamus to negative feedback inhibition. Now that's really a pretty complex term, but uh, if you understand uh, Walter Cannon's uh, theories back in the early 20s uh, about homeostasis, and he pointed out that we need to maintain various physiological and biochemical parameters in a very narrow uh, range in order to be compatible with good health and life. And there had to be a system to uh, keep this, uh, the body homeostatic. Well, it's kind of like a, a thermostat, which uh, when the temperature goes up, the air conditioner comes on, and when the uh, temperature goes up too high or drops too low, the heater comes on. So the temperature is uh, in a very narrow range. And in the body, it's the same way with glucose, blood pressure, uh, temperature. All of these things must be kept within uh, narrow ranges. And what Dillman pointed out is that it's like a cybernetic system that controls it, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the target organ. And that the only way that this system can develop is that central regulator has to be less less sensitive to negative feedback inhibition. The best example of this would be a, a little girl. If her hypothalamus remained sensitive and the system was very stable, then even the tiny amounts of estrogen that are produced in infancy would be enough to cause feedback inhibition of the hypothalamus that would mm -hmm. prevent the production of, ex of higher amounts of FSH and LH. Basically, uh, the system would remain stable, growth would never occur. The only way uh, for growth and development to occur was for this central regulator to become progressively less sensitive. And that works fine up until young adulthood when we're at our prime. Everything is at its optimum level and the system then should say, okay, well, we're where we want to be, let's just quit. Well, the body's not designed that way, it just keeps on becoming progressively less sensitive. Consequently, uh, this results in progressively higher levels of cortisol, progressively higher levels of uh, insulin. We become insulin resistant, and these things cause all of the 
uh, age-related degenerative diseases, which are basically symptoms of this one disease from which we all are going to suffer, which is the aging process. That's very uh, interesting. So what you're saying is normal people have an inhibition mechanism that inhibits the hypothalamus from producing certain hormones. And your theory states that if we can uh, inhibit the inhibitory, basically stop or less make the brain less sensitive to ne uh, negative feedback inhibition, uh, you're going to produce more hormones instead of reducing the hormones. Now, uh, what we're going to do, what we want to do is maintain stability. And the way we do that is that we restore hypothalamic sensitivity to negative feedback and, inhibition. And how do you do that? That's a very good question. And that's what I asked Professor Dillman. And I said, uh, Dr. Dillman, what is the best anti-aging drug there is? Well, back in 1979, he did a study with a drug called Fenformin. Fenformin is a biguanide anti-diabetic drug that used to be available in the United States but it was taken off the market in 1978 due to a number of excess deaths due to uh, lactic acidosis. And of course that drug has subsequently been replaced by another one, metformin. Metformin uh, is the number one drug for diabetes. But, and so everybody thinks, well, metformin is just for diabetes. Well, no, di uh, metformin has a multitude of beneficial effects. Uh, including restoring hypothalamic sensitivity to negative feedback inhibition. I know that's a, a mouthful, but after years and years, it, it just rolls off my tongue. But so you want more negative feedback inhibition? We want, to, we want the hypothalamus to be more sensitive to negative feedback inhibition, correct, once it right. uh, hits its optimum point. So you believe these, uh, these biguanides like metformin can help? Absolutely. In fact, uh, there's a study uh, that's just been approved uh, in the end of 2015. It's called TAME, the Targeting Aging with Metformin Study. And this is a real paradigm shift for the FDA because the FDA, as you know, they always think, got to have a disease, one drug, one drug per disease, and uh, that a drug can only be used to treat a particular disease. And of course, they don't, they've never recognized the aging process as a disease, but in this TAME study, uh, they're uh, recruiting 3,000 men from 65 to 80 years old who are not diabetic, and they're gonna put them on uh, metformin uh, to see if it will delay the onset of these certain endpoints, such as death, myocardial infarction, and cancer. And uh, the reason for this is that Dillman and a number of other researchers have shown that metformin is capable of increasing the maximum lifespan of many species. And so they want to see if this same... Oh, by uh, restoring homostasis and make the hypothalamus exactly. less sensitive to negative feedback inhibition. Right, and by restoring insulin receptor sensitivity. What a lot of people miss out on is the fact that metformin is not just an insulin receptor sensitizer. Right. It's a multi-hormone receptor sensitizer. It, restores the sensitivity of uh, testosterone, cortisol, estrogen, progesterone, so that these hormones actually work better. It's like a metabolic rejuvenator. And uh, so it has a, a wide range of beneficial effects. And uh, this TAME study is gonna see if it will also extend the maximum lifespan of humans as well. Besides metformin, uh, what else do you think could uh, cause the same result? Well, that's a good question. And there were other things that Dillman had uh, researched, one of which was uh, uh, Dilantin, a uh, well-known uh, anti-seizure drug. He showed that that had insulin receptor sensitizing effects. Mm -hmm. Another one is uh, Depranil, which is well-known to have uh, also extended the maximum lifespan of experimental animals. And it acts as a, uh, it, you know, People thought at first Depranil or Selegiline was a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor, but it also acts as a, uh, a dopaminergic receptor sensitizer. I learned that uh, in Monaco in the year 2000 when I met Professor Knoll who designed Selegiline, and he had heard me speak, and then he, uh, I talked to him a little bit about the effects of uh, Depranil, and he said, well, it's kind of like metformin, except it restores the receptor sensitivity of dopamine in the brain. And uh, so this is, uh, he said it, it is a, a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor, but the biggest effect is this 
dopaminergic receptor sensitizing effect. And of course, uh, as I said, it, it has also extended the maximum lifespan of uh, a lot of species. Well, that's very interesting. So besides metformin and the MO, AI inhibitors, any natural supplements that can do this? Well, berberine is in, and well, Nancy, I know everybody wants to not use drugs, they want to use natural substances. Well, metformin is actually uh, an, uh, an analog of French lilac, Galega officinalis. Problem with uh, French lilac is that it has guanidine in it, which can be toxic. And this is one time the, ph the pharmaceutical companies got it right because uh, with metformin, I've used uh, uh, the French lilac and I've used metformin. They're both, uh, metformin is better. Now berberine has a lot of the same effects as metformin and in fact, they're probably best used together because uh, I know with, uh, for polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, metformin is the drug of choice and right. berberine is also very effective in polycystic uh, ovary. How's berberine taken? Uh, orally, it's a uh, herb, just take it as... A pill or...? Yeah, 500 milligrams, about the same dosage as mm -hmm. uh, with metformin, I'd say uh, three times a day. So, you know, there's been a lot of side effects with, with some forms of metformin and other forms not so much. Do you have a particular preference to which metformin you recommend? Yeah, well, you're right. And one of the problems, the, the most common side effect with metformin diarrhea. is diarrhea and it can be explosive. Right. right. And that's in about 20% of the people. 80% don't have a problem, but there's a 20%. Right. So you use the really extended did. release? Well, uh, yeah, uh, I will use that. I start them out on the uh, regular initially because the uh, Publix uh, grocery stores in uh, Florida uh, give it away free. Uh, and so I figure free is better than any price. So the dose of metformin you use, is that one 500 milligram pill a day? No, uh, I usually start people with uh, 1,500 a day. Just to start? Yeah, and, that, and I'll usually keep them there unless they, they're diabetic and then I'll bump them up to 1,000 twice a Are day. Are you measuring certain uh, functions, kind of renal function and so on? You know, and I know what you're leading at here because the most serious toxic effect of uh, adverse effect of metformin, you'll see the black box about, uh, is lactic acidosis. Well, lactic acidosis is the reason they took fenformin off the market. And uh, I talked to a diabetologist back in uh, early days and he said, yeah, he said the reason they did that was because the stupid doctors kept prescribing it in the face of impaired renal function. And with metformin, it's much less propensity for lactic acidosis. In fact, a recent study showed that they had 180,000 years of uh, patient years of uh, uh, metformin use and without serious uh, 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 lactic acidosis. Uh, and I think, as you point out, just clearly reduce the dose in the face of uh, uh, chronic kidney disease. But a lot of doctors, if somebody has chronic kidney disease, they take them off metformin altogether when what they really should be doing is reducing the dose uh, to a dose that the mm -hmm. patient can tolerate, and usually that's about 500 milligrams a day. Do you take metformin? I do. I take 1,000 twice a day, oh, and I've been doing it since the early 90s when Dillman told me to take and in, it. And in your patients who you have on or yourself, you're not seeing episodes of hypoglycemia at all? No, right? you never see hypoglycemia in uh, metformin users unless they're taking uh, di uh, uh, insulin or using a cell phone or urea. Oh. But uh, metformin itself, it actually, uh, because it restores insulin receptor sensitivity, uh, there's, uh, even those who are tend to be hypoglycemic, they do better when they're taking it. And the patients usually feel better, have more energy, and lose their carbohydrate cravings. Great, it's excellent stuff, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we appreciate your coming and speaking at the conference. Thanks. Well, it's good okay. to be here and all the uh, other doctors that I'm learning so much from. Great. Thank you. Thank you.